Francisco, that's uh, swell with uh, Forget About Jesus. Uh, blimey, Graham's turned up now. Amazing tonight. It's one of those nights where uh, just everybody's turned up. Uh, you know, in the, the canteen opened late or something. I mean, there's got to be a sort of an incentive for uh, everybody coming in the building, hasn't the Lord? What? Right, uh, what are we doing now? I'm getting a bit hoarse, actually. So um, I thought I'd uh, hand the show over to uh, Lard now. Hi, everybody. One second. Anyway, right, uh, our guest reader all this week is uh, Sarah Cracknell. Sarah from... Cracknell. Yes, all right, I'm, uh, you had your chance. Right. I'm doing it on my Sorry, own Sorry, carry now. on. I'm going to turn you down. Yeah, I would. Yeah, see, it works. Right, okay. Sarah Cracknell from St Etienne is like, Shut up! Like, now, you've made me even hoarser now. Do you mind? you made me look at that now. I'm uh, croaky. Choky. Croaky. 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 Can't even talk. Shut up. You're putting what me off now. You're putting... You're, your microphone's turned off. Nobody can hear you. Whatever. I'm talking to myself. Sarah Cracknell from... Uh, Sa Go on, then. Mr. Sarah Clapper Cracknell Trousers. this week Sarah will be Cracknell. reading uh, Go on. from something or other and she'll be doing it with there. a bit of a tune underneath. <laughs> you don't it'd know. Rather, it'd be smart, will not it, our kid? You hey? don't know, dear. It's dead easy, this lark. You, you just pull the wool over people's eyes. You make you think it looks hard and all that. I mean, you know, if people are out there in Radio Land, they all think you're dead clever. It's dead easy. Sarah Cracknell from Saturday and she's going to be doing some doofers this week and it's going to be right cracking. Joseph Conrad. That's the bunny. Heart of Darkness. Smart. Which is the basis of Apocalypse Now. Oh, yes. And St uh, Strange Voyages, the music, which is from Apocalypse Now. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah, of course it was. Get cracking, says. Nice one. The traffic of the great city went on in the deepening night upon the sleepless river. We looked on, waiting patiently... There was nothing else to do till the end of the flood, but it was only after a long silence when he said, in a hesitating voice, I suppose you fellows remember I did once turn freshwater sailor for a bit, that we knew we were fated before the ebb began to run to hear about one of Marlowe's inconclusive experiences. I don't want to bother you much with what happened to me personally, he began, yet to understand the effect of it on me, you ought to know how I got out there. What I saw, how I went up that river to the place where I first met the poor chap. It was the farthest point of navigation and the culminating point of my experience. It seemed somehow to throw a kind of light on everything about me and into my thoughts. It was sombre enough too and pitiful, not extraordinary in any way, not very clear either. No, not very clear. And yet it seemed to throw a kind of light. Now, when I was a little chap, I had a passion for maps. I would look for hours at South America or Africa or Australia and lose myself in all the glories of exploration. Other places were scattered about the equator and in every sort of latitude all over the two hemispheres. I've been in some of them and, well, we won't talk about that, but there was one yet, the biggest, the most blank, so to speak, that I had a hankering after. True, by this time it was not a blank space anymore. It had got filled since my boyhood with rivers and lakes and names. It had ceased to be a blank space of delightful mystery, a white patch for a boy to dream gloriously over. It had become a place of darkness. But there was in it one river especially, a mighty big river that you could see on the map, resembling an immense snake uncoiled, with its head in the sea, its body at rest curving afar over a vast country, and its tail lost in the depths of the land. And as I looked at the map, in a shop window, it fascinated me as a snake would a bird, a silly little bird. Then I remembered there was a big concern, a company for trade on that river. Dash it all, I thought to myself, they can't trade without using some kind of craft on that lot of fresh water. Steamboats. Why shouldn't I try to get charge of one? The snake had charmed me. Mm. Have you ever read that? I haven't. Actually. It's I very hard work. 
I tried to read it after watching Apocalypse Now, but a lot of people did. Yeah. And um, you, you just can't, really. It's just too miserable, Heart of Darkness. All right. And all, I've tried to read other Joseph Conrad, and it's just all too miserable. And I only mention that because he's playing at the Bop for Bosnia. What, Joe? Leo Sayer, Joseph Conrad, top night out. Right, okay, brilliant. Lots of big Joseph Conrad fans. I know you were saying earlier. Which, uh, It'll class, be there class, then. Class, class, class. Anyway, so uh, in case you uh, weren't listening last night and you don't know, uh, Heart of Darkness is the uh, basis of uh, Apocalypse Now. Uh, written by Joseph Conrad, read by Sarah Cracknell. I left in a French steamer, and she called in every blamed port they had out there, for as far as I could see, the sole purpose of landing soldiers and custom house officers. I watched the coast. Watching a coast as it slips by the ship is like thinking about an enigma. There it is before you, smiling, frowning, inviting, grand, mean, insipid or savage, and always mute with an air of whispering, come and find out. This was one almost featureless, as if still in the making, with an aspect of monotonous grimness. The edge of a colossal jungle so dark green as to be almost black, fringed with white surf, ran straight like a ruled line far, far away along a blue sea whose glitter was blurred by a creeping mist. The sun was fierce. The land seemed to glisten and drip with steam. Here and there, greyish, whitish specks showed up clustered inside the white surf, with a flag flying above them, perhaps. Settlements some centuries old and still no bigger than pinheads on the untouched expanse of their background. Once, I remember, we came upon a man of war anchored off the coast. There wasn't even a shed there, and she was shelling the bush. It appears the French had one of their wars going on thereabouts. Her ensign dropped limp like a rag. The muzzles of the long six-inch guns stuck out all over the low hull. The greasy, slimy swell swung her up lazily and let her down, swaying her thin masts. In the empty immensity of earth, sky and water, there she was, incomprehensible, firing into a continent. Pop would go one of the six-inch guns. A small flame would dart and vanish. A little white smoke would disappear. A tiny projectile would give a feeble screech and nothing happened. Nothing could happen. There was a touch of insanity in the proceeding, a sense of lugubrious drollery in the sight, and it was not dissipated by somebody on board assuring me earnestly there was a camp of natives. He called them enemies, hidden out of sight somewhere. It was upward of 30 days before I saw the mouth of the big river. We anchored off the seat of the government, but my work would not begin till some 200 miles farther on. So as soon as I could, I made a start for a place 30 miles higher up. I had to wait in the station for 10 days, an eternity. I lived in a hut in the yard, but to be out of the chaos I would sometimes get into the accountant's office. It was built of horizontal planks and so badly put together that, as he bent over his high desk, he was barred from neck to heels with narrow strips of sunlight. There was no need to open the big shutters to see. It was hot there too. Big flies buzzed fiendishly and did not sting but stabbed. I sat generally on the floor while, of faultless appearance, and even slightly scented, perching on a high stool, he wrote. One day, he remarked without lifting his head, in the interior you will no doubt meet Mr. Kurtz. On my asking who Mr. Kurtz was, he said he was a first-class agent, and seeing my disappointment at this information, he added slowly, laying down his pen, he is a very remarkable person. Further questions elicited from him that Mr. Kurtz was at present in charge of a trading post, a very important one, in the true ivory country. Sends in as much ivory as all the others put together. He began to write again. The flies buzzed at a great piece. When you see Mr. Kurtz, he went on, tell him from me that everything here, he glanced at the desk, 
is very satisfactory. I don't like to write to him. With those messengers of ours, you never know who may get hold of your letter at that central station. He stared at me for a moment with his mild, bulging eyes. Oh, he will go far, very far, he began again. He will be a somebody in the administration before long. They, above, the council in Europe, you know, mean him to be. He turned to his work, and presently in going out I stopped at the door. I could see the still treetops of the Grove of Death. Next day, I left that station at last with a caravan of 60 men for a 200-mile tramp. He began to speak as soon as he saw me. I had been very long on the road. He could not wait. Had to start without me. The upriver stations had to be relieved. There had been so many delays already that he did not know who was dead and who was alive and how they got on and so on and so on. He paid no attention to my explanations and, playing with a stick of sealing wax, repeated several times that the situation was very grave, very grave. There were rumours that a very important station was in jeopardy, and its chief, Mr. Kurtz, was ill. Hoped it was not true. Mr. Kurtz was, I felt, weary and irritable. Hang Kurtz, I thought. I interrupted him by saying, I had heard of Mr. Kurtz on the coast. Ah, so they talk of him down there, he murmured to himself. Then he began again, assuring me Mr. Kurtz was the best agent he had, an exceptional man, for the greatest importance to the company therefore I could understand his anxiety. He was, he said, very, very uneasy. Certainly he fidgeted on his chair a good deal, exclaimed, Ah, Mr. Kurtz, broke the stick of sealing wax and seemed dumbfounded by the accident. I went to work the next day, turning, so to speak, my back on that station. In that way only it seemed to me I could keep my hold on the redeeming facts of life. Still, one must look about sometimes. And then I saw this station, these men strolling aimlessly about in the sunshine of the yard. I asked myself sometimes what it all meant. They wandered here and there with their absurd long staves in their hands, like a lot of faithless pilgrims bewitched inside a rotten fence. The word ivory rang in the air, was whispered, was sighed. You would think they were praying to it. A taint of imbecile rapacity blew through it all like a whiff from some corpse. By Jove! I've never seen anything so unreal in my life. And outside the silent wilderness surrounding this cleared speck on the earth struck me as something great and invincible, like evil or truth, waiting patiently for the passing away of this fantastic invasion. bass solo Strange Voyage from the uh, soundtrack of Apocalypse Now and uh, that's Sarah Cracknell from uh, St Etienne who's doing the reading I've not got anything in particular to say at, at this point I was just coming in to make a nice seamless bridge between uh, the mood set by Sarah and this <laughs> Mark Radcliffe, missing you already.